Hello and welcome to Bay College's video lectures for intermediate algebra. In this video, we're going to look at section 6.4, which is solving radical equations. Before we actually get into radical equations, we're going to define a few things and hopefully have a deeper understanding. Here we have a radical, the square root of x equals 4. Now, to uh, solve this radical, what I have to do is get rid of it. I have to isolate the radical to one side of the equation. In this case, it already is. And then I have to raise it to the power of the index. So I identify the index to be 2. It's a square root. So I'm going to square both sides. If I square a square root, it essentially cancels. Because if we think of it in terms of the uh, rational exponent, a square root is the same as x to the 1 half, the square root of x. So now if I use the power rule, 2 times 1 half, well, that's just x to the first. Half of 2 is 1. And we end up with 4 squared here gives us 16. So x to the first, or just x, is 16. Now that we've solved that, what we can do is we can check it. The square root of 16 is 4. Our original equation was the square root of x equals 4. So the square root of 16, our solution, equals 4. Now, one thing we have to be aware of, and essentially what we did, is we use the property of equality. What we do to one side, we do to the other. And in this case, I squared it. Essentially, what that says is if we have a value equal to another value, if I square or raise it to some power n, what I do to one side, I have to do to the other. Now, when we added or subtracted or multiplied or divided to either side of any equation, we didn't change the equation. When we raise both sides of an uh, equation to some power, we actually do change it. What we get is a related equation. It contains the same solutions, but it may have additional solutions. And those are called extraneous. And that's why it's extremely important to check our answer. Let's look at an example of the simplest kind to see where we might get an extraneous uh, solution. Let's take a look at this and say, OK, well, I have x equals 8. I'm going to square both sides. So what I do to one side, I'm doing to the other. So x squared is x squared, and 8 squared is 64. Now, if we look at this, it looks like our original equation that we did back here. Now I'm going to introduce a square root, which is essentially the 1 half power. So if I raise this side to the 1 half, and I raise this side to the 1 half, or essentially, let's rewrite it this way, because the 1 half power is a square root. When I introduce a square root, I have to realize that there are two solutions. Because a negative times a negative is a positive. Maybe it's negative 8 in this case, because it's 64. And a positive times a positive is a positive. So when I introduce a square root, I ha always have to remember it could be plus or minus that value. So the square root of x squared is just x when we simplify this radical. And the square root of 64 is 8. But positive 8 squared gives me 64. But so does negative 8 squared. Negative 8 times negative 8 is 64. So there are two solutions here. And if we go back to the original equation, we can see, well, x equals 8. That's what we started with. And then we used that property of raising both sides to a power. And then when we went to solve it, the related equation we had had additional solutions, two possibilities, positive and negative 8, when only the positive 8 makes this a true statement. Negative 8 is not equal to 8. So that's why it's very important to check our solutions when we solve an equation with radicals. All right, let's look at some of the rules that we're going to follow, or some of the steps, when it comes to solving equations that contain radicals. The first one is to isolate a radical on one side. If you have more than one radical, just choose one of them, isolate it to one side of the equal sign, and then move on to the next step. The next step is to raise each side of the equation to the power of the index of the radical we're solving for. If it's uh, an index of 2 or a square root, we want to raise both sides to the second power. If it's a cube root, we're going to want to cube both sides. Once we've done step two, then we can attempt to solve it. We can find that variable, isolate that variable, and solve it. If 
a radical still remains, we're going to want to repeat those steps to find uh, any remaining solution. So repeat if another radical still remains. We'll go back to step one and work through it. Once we've done that and we've eliminated all radicals and solved for the variable in question, we need to check all the solutions. And I'm going to underline that one because it's very important to check every solution that we get just in case some of them are extraneous, additional solutions. So let's look at some examples. We'll work through a few of them. The first step is to isolate the radical. Here I have the square root of the quantity 2x minus 3 minus 2 equals 1. Well, before I can start to solve uh, what's under that radical, I have to isolate it. So I'm going to add 2 to both sides. So I get the square root of 2x minus 3 equals 3. Now I've isolated the radical. So now I can raise both sides to the power of the index. The index is 2, so I'm going to square both sides. Now when I square this, since this is the 1 half power, 1 half of 2 is just 1, essentially they eliminate each other. Squaring a square root gives you what's under the radical, the radicand. Here, 3 squared gives me 9. Now I can go ahead and just solve this. Add 3 to both sides, divide by 2, and I get x equals 6. I have to check this because it's possible that maybe this has no solution. I only found one. Maybe this is extraneous. So let's put it back into the original equation. 2 times 6 is 12. 12 minus 3 is 9. The square root of 9 is 3. 3 minus 2 is 1. That's a true statement. This is the solution. So I did find it, and I checked it, so I know it's not extraneous. Let's look at the next example. Again, I have a radical. I have to isolate it as my first step. And to do that, I just need to add 3 to both sides. So we get the cubed root of x minus 2 equals 3. Now, my index this time is 3, so I want to raise both sides to the power of 3. Now, when I cube a cubed root, just like when I squared a square root, it eliminated each other because we're essentially taking 1 third of 3. Well, 1 third of 3 is 1, one of these factors under that radical, the radicand. 3 cubed is 27. Now I can solve this by adding 2 to both sides. And I get x equals 29. I need to check that answer to make sure it's not extraneous. 29 minus 2 is or in the original equation. 29 minus 2 is 27. The cubed root of 27 is 3. 3 minus 3 is 0. This makes it a true statement. Now, the next one. If we're paying really close attention, we're going to use the same process. But hopefully, we might identify something that will save us some time. I'm going to isolate the radical. I just need to subtract 2 from both sides. And if we recognize something for a moment here, we have the square root of x minus 8 equals negative 2. If we understand square roots, this is an even index. Even indexes will never give us a negative value. There is no value times itself that will be negative, at least not a real value. So if we can identify that, a square root equal to a negative, that is not a real solution. We can stop right here and say no real solution. But what if we didn't recognize that? What if we said, OK, well, I isolated the radical. Now it's time to square both sides. So if I square both sides, this side squared gives me what's under the, radic the radical, which is the radicand. This side squared, negative 2 squared, is a positive 4. Now if I solve for x, I add 8 to both sides. x equals 12. If I didn't recognize that and I came to this solution, this is extraneous. Let's actually use this solution in the original equation and see if it gives us a true statement. 12 minus 8 is 4. The square root of 4 is 2. 2 plus 2 is not equal to 0. So that doesn't work. That's why it's important to check our answers, because this is extraneous 
if we square both sides. We have a related equation, but it, since it had no solution, it does not uh, provide us with anything that's useful, I suppose. Now, what if we have more than one radical, like in this example here? Well, if you have more than one radical, just choose one of them and isolate it and go through the process. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to choose this one here and say, well, it's already isolated. It's by itself on one side of the equation. So I'm ready to square both sides. If I square this side, it gets rid of the radical and gives me the radican. Well, just by chance, that's what happens here. Maybe if I had another value out here, I might have to use FOIL because I'd have two terms. And then we covered multiplying radicals in the previous section. So I'm going to square that. Well, it just happens to get rid of that radical as well. And now I can go ahead and solve for x. I'm going to subtract an x from both sides. And I'm going to subtract 3 from both sides. So I get negative 2 equals x, which means x equals negative 2. So I did skip the step. I combined them into 1 to come to that value. Now I have to check this to make sure it's a true statement. Well, let me put it in here. I have the square root of negative 2 plus 1 would be negative 1. The square root of a negative, because this is an even uh, index, is not a real solution. This has no solution, just like the previous example. But it wasn't, uh, or I should say, no real solution. So it has no real solution, because what we found does not work in the original equation. Uh, it gives us negatives under the radical. And we can't take the square root of the negative at this point. But we will uh, cover that before this chapter is over. Let's look at this example here. We have the square root of 28 plus 2x equals x plus 2. Well, our radical is already isolated, so we're ready to square it. So if I square this side, it gives me what's under the radicand. If I square this side, I'm squaring x plus 2. I essentially have to FOIL that out or uh, use my formula of squaring a binomial. x squared plus twice the, the product of the two terms plus the last term squared. You'll get that same result if you FOIL it. Now I can uh, recognize this as a quadratic. And we haven't really covered quadratics, and that's why I'm working this one uh, through for you. But to solve a quadratic, we generally set it equal to 0. So if I set this equal to 0, I'm going to subtract 2x from both sides. Just wait on that. And that's going to give me x squared plus 2x. And I'm going to subtract 28 as well, negative 24. So I set the equation equal to 0. And hopefully, we recall factoring. We can solve this by factoring. What are the factors of negative 24? They have different signs. So they have a difference of positive 2. Well, if I'm factoring that, that's going to give me x plus 6, x minus 4. Now we can just use something called the zero factor theorem, something you should be familiar with. 0 times anything is 0. What would make this factor 0? Well, if x is a negative 6, and if uh, for this factor, if x is a positive 4, those values would be 0. 0 times anything is 0. If this is negative 6, 0 times anything is 0. So I found two solutions, but I had to use factoring to do so because this was quadratic. So x equals negative 6 and 4. I need to test both of these solutions. One of them, or maybe even both of them, might be extraneous. So I'm going to try negative 6 first. So we have the square root of 28 plus 2 times the value of negative 6 would be negative 12. 28 and negative 12 is going to give me the square root of 16. Well, the square root of 16 is 4. Over here, negative 6 plus 2 would be negative 4. When I plugged in a negative 6, this is what both sides simplified to. 4 is not equal to negative 4, so that is an extraneous solution. Let's try the other one. Hopefully, this one will work. 28 plus 2 times 4 would be 28 plus 8, which would give me 36. The square root of 36 is 6. If I put that same variable in for this x, 4 plus 2 is 6. 6 equals 6 is a true statement. So my solution is x equals 
4. The negative 6 was extraneous. All right, I'm going to leave this example for you to try. It's the square root of x plus 8 minus 2 equals 0. And uh, <clears throat> give that a try. Make sure you check your work. And we'll move to another board and look at an application problem. So we're going to look at this application problem that uh, is going to deal with introducing a radical equation here. Uh, our application is one of the tallest structures in the United States is a TV tower in the state of North Dakota. Its height is 2,063 feet. A 2,383 foot cable is used to attach from the top of the tower to the ground. Approximate to the nearest foot how far from the base of the tower this cable should be, or should be anchored, excuse me. So what I did here is I drew a little illustration where this line indicates the height of the tower. And that was given information. And I was told that the tower is 2,063 feet tall. We're also told that there is a cable that is to be anchored from the top to the ground. And that cable is 2,383 feet. Notice it's a little bit longer than that one. So it appears a little bit longer in my illustration. Then we were asked, how far should that cable be anchored? And this is where it's anchored from the base of the tower to where it should be anchored. That's what we're asked to find. Now, if we think about what a tower is, a tower goes straight up. And that cable is going to be coming straight or well at an angle to the ground. This is going to form a right triangle. So what we have to bring to the application problem is the prior knowledge of knowing how to work with right triangles. Hopefully, we remember Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where a and b are the legs of our triangle, and c is the hypotenuse, the longest uh, side of a triangle. And if we look at our illustration, we can see that that would be the 2,383 feet. So let's use this equation to find that value of the base, how far from the base of the tower to where this cable will be anchored. So I'm going to call uh, this value my a, this value my b, and the longest side c. So a is going to be x squared, because the, this value has to be squared. b is 2,063 squared, because b is squared. And c is going to be. 2,383, and that value is also squared. Now, to solve this, even though the numbers may be intimidating right now because they're relatively large, and trust me, they're going to get larger, what we want to do is isolate this variables. And I can do that by subtracting this value from both sides. When I do that, I'm going to get 2,000. 383 squared minus 2,063 squared. Now, <clears throat> I wouldn't expect you to know this answer off the top of your head. You could work it out on paper, and that would be tedious. But in an example like this, this is where I'd say this is a go-to problem for using a calculator. I generally try to. Uh, um, not use calculators or minimize their use as much as possible so we can build those math skills that are, that are needed. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to square this. And I've already done that uh, in a calculator. So I'm not doing this off the top of my head. And I wouldn't expect you to do that. We get 5,678,689. That's this value squared. And 2,063 squared is 4,255,969. Now we can find their difference. And if we find their difference, we get 1,422,720. Now, we haven't seen a radical up to this point, yet this application problem deals with the section in radicals. Well, here's where we need to introduce a radical. To get rid of something squared, if we recall when we solved radical equations, if we had a radical, we raised it to the index. Well, here, to get rid of a power, 
we can take a, a radical of that power's index. So if I take a square root or an index of 2 of both sides, we can find that solution. But one thing we have to be aware of, and we're going to see this in the next chapter over and over, whenever you introduce a radical, you have to recall that there are two possibilities, the positive and the negative. Now, here's an example where that negative is really going to be the extraneous value because we're dealing with a distance. When it comes to distances, they're absolute values. So that negative is the extraneous value. We don't really need it in this particular case. So if I take the square root of something squared, I get the radicand. It's just x, right? And the square root of 1,422,720 in a calculator would give me 1192.7782, or yeah, that's right, 8269. Like I said, I've already used a calculator to find these values. I'm not doing it off the top of my head here. Now, I found this value that this distance to be 1,192.778269. Now, I could assume that's the answer and leave it at that. But with every application problem, we have to recall there's units. And we also have to go back and reread the problem to make sure, does this answer make sense? And did I actually answer the question? So let's go back to the problem here and reread it. We're talking about one of the tallest structures in the United States this TV tower, which is 2,063 feet high. The cable, 2,383 feet, is used to anchor it to the ground. Approximate to the nearest foot. Well, I haven't done that with my answer, and I haven't applied units yet. So we have to go back to our answer and say it's 1,193, because it was 1,192.77. Well, if we're rounding it to the nearest foot, it would round to 1,193. And it has units of feet. Does this answer the question? And does this sound like a reasonable answer? Well, if the tower is that tall and it's hypotenuse of that triangle we drew would be the longer side, it makes sense that this side is a reasonable answer. It's shorter than my hypotenuse. We have 1,193 feet. And it does answer the question. We have the units. And we've completed the task that we set out to do. So this has been section 6.4. Keep practicing, and thank you for watching.